Welcome to Not Too Reads, an audio library of revolutionary texts. Chile, an attempt at historic compromise. The Real Story of the Allende Years by Jorge Palacios. Chapter 2 The Ideology of Defeat The Peaceful Road to Power As we have pointed out in the beginning of this book, the dominant line in the CP of Chile was an opportunist line, both in its program and in its concrete political activities, and this had been the case long before the 20th Congress of the CPSU. During this period, however, these purely reformist activities and lines were not systematized as a thesis revising Marxism. On the other hand, these reformist lines and political practices coexisted within the old CP, and they did so peacefully until the 20th Congress, with a certain theoretical education of the party activists on the basis of the works of Marx, Engels, Lenin, Stalin, and Mao, or of Marxist revolutionary history. While in the Condre schools all of this was studied, the political line was condemning the activists to engage in economist struggles, in election battles, in ceaseless money-raising campaigns, in propaganda work for this very line, and in purely reformist activities aimed, in the final analysis, at winning some votes in the elections. At no time was there a relation between the teachings of the Marxist classics or the revolutionary history and what was required from the Chilean communists. There was also no relation between their program, for example, and the minimal conditions required from a party to be admitted in the Communist International of Lenin. These conditions were never met. The truth is that this contradiction was concealed and veiled by various circumstances. During the decade prior to the Second World War, a misunderstanding and a wrong application of the policy of anti-fascist United Fronts negating the principle of both unity and struggle within these fronts and the necessity of proletarian leadership over them, allowed opportunism to make its way into various places through these correct alliances. This is precisely what happened in Chile. On the other hand, during and immediately after the war, the opportunist and anti-Marxist trend initiated by Browder had tremendous influence in Latin America. Finally, concerning Chile, the dominant reformist and opportunist trends were not seen through because of the ban against the CP and the legal persecution of its activists and their work. It was this illegal status and the persecutions, 1947 to 1957, as well as the necessity to organize underground and the reactionary propaganda that called the CP activists subversive that conferred a revolutionary aureole upon this party. Also, there was the idea of doing something to overthrow the González Vilela government, which was circulated amongst a large number of militants and even some leaders. But this was only a state of mind on the part of those who had been betrayed by González Vilela and wanted to take revenge, or rumors spread once in a while to raise the morale of the activists until legality would be restored. These leaders never presented a consistent policy aimed at developing class struggle, so as to achieve this goal. The official policy was to wage struggles for demands, to participate in elections under the cover of other forces, and to protest against repressive measures, begging for the restoration of the previous legal rights of the CP. Finally, the struggle opposing the tendency of a tiny group of CP activists and some leaders, who organized putschist actions against the government, and that of the remaining leadership, who only wanted the restoration of legality and of the right to run in the elections at whatever cost, resulted in a split. After the expulsion of this small, rebellious group, the domination of the most rightist and opportunist trend within the CP was complete. However, the contradiction between such leaders and a large number of activists, who honestly considered themselves Marxist, who had suffered from the reactionary repression, and who had access to Marxist literature, had in no way been suppressed nor resolved. This contradiction was brought in the open when the ruling classes legalized the CP again and when the anti-Marxist theses deprived of any originality 
put forward in the past by Bernstein and Kautsky became the international line set by, quote, the prominent tribune of the 20th Congress of the CPSU, unquote. This Congress was held in 1956, and the Chilean CP was given back its legal status the following year. From the 20th Congress of the CPSU onward, the leaders of the CP, and especially Luis Corbalan, its present Secretary General, began, following the Soviet revisionist ideologues, to systematize and to publicly promote an opportunist political theory aimed at justifying and pursuing the opportunist political practice, which had, in fact, been theirs for many years. In this manner, while they were beginning to theorize and hoping to justify their parliamentary cretinism, their respect of bourgeois legality and their opportunist line through writings, they only highlighted their extreme opportunism before their activists who, although profoundly dissatisfied with their political activity within the CP, were unable to understand the anti-Marxist ideological roots of such an opportunism. 1. Corbalan's Arguments In February 1961, the CP leadership published a pamphlet entitled Our Revolutionary Road, which was a collection of various articles by Corbalan defending the theses of the 20th Congress of the CPSU. In this pamphlet, he was defending the idea that in Chile, a peaceful road to socialism was possible. Pretending that he was applying Marxism to the conditions of Chile in a creative and original way, Corbalan was in fact only plagiarizing the opportunist nonsense of Khrushchev, who, on the other hand, was just repeating the rotten arguments put forward by the old renegades already repudiated by Marx, Engels, Lenin, and Stalin. Quoting, for example, the Soviet neo-revisionist Kusinin, Corbalan tries to justify the peaceful road to power for Chile by arguing that Marx had admitted this possibility for England and the United States in 1872. And he does so with all the dishonesty characteristic of the conscious opportunists, because he certainly knows what Lenin himself wrote on this question. Quote, the argument that Marx in the 70s allowed for the possibility of a peaceful transition to socialism in England and America is completely fallacious, or, to put it bluntly, dishonest, in that it's juggling with quotations and references. Firstly, Marx regarded it as an exception even then. Secondly, in those days, monopoly capitalism, i.e. imperialism, did not exist. Thirdly, in England and America, there was no military clique then, as there is now serving as the chief apparatus of the bourgeois state machine, end quote. Let us just add that the factors pointed out by Lenin in order to refute the fraudulent utilization of Marx's quotation by Kautsky, i.e. militarism, imperialism, etc., not only have not decreased in importance, but have taken monstrous proportions. Thus, the swindle of Corbalan, who is also juggling with quotations and references, is even worse than that of Kautsky. In another article, conscious of the fact that the entire historical experience goes against his wrong thesis of peaceful road to socialism, Corbalan completely reverses the Marxist theory of knowledge and writes, quote, Even though there has been no example of socialist revolution through the peaceful road, it was not necessary to rely on historical precedents to establish the thesis that this road is possible. If to develop any Marxist-Leninist thesis, end quote, he adds, Quote, it was necessary to have practical proof of it, a complete realization, the classics of Marxism would never have been able to develop many of their theses. End quote. Of course, the occurrence of a fact is not necessary for us to foresee it. Marx and his followers foresaw the socialist society at a time when it had not materialized in any country. However, if the prediction of a new fact is to be scientific, it has to be based on events, conditions, and historical laws that make it possible and necessary. Otherwise, such a prediction is only the expression of either wishful thinking or the conscious intention to mislead with false declarations. As for the possibility of a peaceful transition to socialism, as we have seen, the factors opposing it not only did not shrivel, but intensified in our era. Therefore, the declarations of Corbalan and those who are docile followers of the falsifiers governing the USSR 
have no basis either in theory or in practice. They are nothing but lies and speculations in the service of an opportunist line. In another part of his writings, Corbelan puts forward another view to defend his bourgeois pacifism that will lead the unarmed Chilean people to massacre. This view implies another complete falsification of the Marxist theory of the state. He says, quote, The proletariat and its party have never been supporters of violence for the sake of violence, end quote, in order to justify the necessity to use peaceful means to take power. Thus, as nobody, except a few mental patients, is for violence for the sake of violence, in fact, the meaning of this clever short sentence of Corbalan is that he refuses to recognize the violence inherent to the bourgeois state. This is why he adds, quote, If the ruling classes resort to violence, it is possible that the people's movement will be forced to follow another path, the armed struggle, end quote. Thus, for Corbalan, violence only exists when the ruling classes resort to prison and massacre as their usual policy. When they do not do these things on a daily basis, when there is a facade of bourgeois democracy, according to Corbalan, we are in a normal situation, having nothing to do with violence, and therefore the people have no right to use it in order to liberate themselves. But anyone fairly versed in Marxism or opening his eyes to reality knew that in Chile, as in any bourgeois regime, the people were subjected to constant violence under a bourgeois dictatorship wearing a democratic mask. It was not a question of future violence, to which they did not respond with the other road Corbalan talks about anyway, but a question of actual daily and permanent violence. That violence was not only expressed in the periodic massacres which occur even in the most democratic capitalist societies, but also in the subjection of the people to wretchedness, unemployment, malnutrition, unsanitary housing conditions, premature death, and, in short, to the conditions inherent to the system of exploitation. Or is it that Mr. Corbalan believes that the Chilean people have voluntarily accepted, because they like them, the misery and ferocious exploitation to which they are subjected? The truth is that they were forced to accept this through violence. This was imposed upon them precisely by a state which, although bourgeois democratic in form, is nevertheless, as Lenin puts it, quote, a special organization of force an organization of violence for the suppression of some class, end quote. Thus, whenever the people fight more intensely to liberate themselves from the daily violence inherent to the system of exploitation, this veiled and hypocritical violence transforms itself into deliberate massacres, jailings, and tortures. It is therefore not a situation, as Corbelan suggests, where the reactionaries may resort to violence, and where, in such a case only, it would be justified to give up the peaceful means. Class dictatorship and violence, open and brutal as today, or veiled by some apparent democratic guarantees, have always existed in Chile, under the different regimes of exploitation. Corbelan reveals his class nature in another text, and he is led to adapt himself to the bourgeois society and to forget the permanent violence that crushes the Chilean people. After having asserted with the utmost frivolity that the armed struggle to overthrow the Chilean ruling classes, quote, would last a maximum of a few days or a few weeks, end quote, because, quote, no government would be able to sustain a stoppage of the main activities during one month, end quote, he states that, quote, peaceful revolution corresponds to the interests of the working class and the masses of the people, end quote. We ask, if, as Corbalan says, a few weeks of struggle is enough for the people to liberate themselves from their exploiters, why is it that he prolongs their sufferings for decades and decades? Corbalan answers with no less original and absurd arguments. Quote, In practice, the Chilean people's movement, given the concrete historical conditions of this country, end quote, he probably refers to the protracted opportunist influence of his party, quote, has for a long time developed along the peaceful road, since the period of the Popular Fronts, for 25 years, end quote. And he adds, quote, If the Chilean people's movement has marched for years on the peaceful road, why is it only now, and not before, that objections are spreading in certain left-wing circles, end quote. 
The very fact that Corbalan asks such questions shows to what extent these sham communists are integrated in the bourgeois society. They are incapable of understanding that the masses of the people are questioning a road to power that has maintained them in misery and exploitation for over half a century. And a further aberration, they use the fact that an error has been maintained for a long time in order to justify the necessity of perpetuating it. Following this logic, when we will celebrate the centennial of the failure of the peaceful road to power, Corbelan's argument advocating the persistence along this road will be even more valid. The fact of the matter is that with his arguments, Corbelan exhibits both his adventurist mind and his ultra-right opportunism, claiming on the one hand that it is possible to overthrow the ruling classes in a few weeks, and presenting on the other hand the prolonged failure of the peaceful road as an argument to justify the very policy that has prevented the people from liberating themselves. The tragic experience the Chilean people have gone through since the fascist coup d'etat has the virtue of showing the falseness of both these assertions. It was not possible to overthrow the power of the ruling classes through the peaceful road in order to establish a kind of state capitalism, let alone using such a road to establish genuine socialism, and neither was it possible for the people's violence to obliterate in a few weeks the violence unleashed by the ruling classes. The concrete form of the peaceful road to socialism in Chile, as advocated by Corbalan, was to use the elections to take power. Showing once again that he has completely betrayed the Marxist theory on the nature of the bourgeois state and on the necessity to destroy it, as Marx, Engels, and Lenin said, in order to establish the dictatorship of the proletariat, Corbalan gives as an example to illustrate the possibility of taking power through the peaceful road the, quote, resounding electoral victories, end quote, won by the CP in supporting bourgeois candidates. The fact that González Videla viciously suppressed the CP after he had been elected by its votes was not even used by him for pondering over the little significance of such resounding victories in the service of the bourgeoisie. On the contrary, on the basis of these examples, he concludes that it is possible to gain power, quote, through the electoral process, end quote, in order to use, quote, the presidential regime to bring about important changes of all sorts, with the free play of all parties and trends, end quote. Thus, in 1961, the theory was already clearly formulated that was to bring about the disaster spearheaded ten years later by the popular unity, the main victim of which was to be the Chilean people. 2. The Marxist-Leninist Opposition After the 20th Congress of the CPSU, when the Chilean CP leaders began to openly formulate their revisionist theories, some activists of the party, honest and loyal to Marxism-Leninism, began to oppose them. On the occasion of a Congress held during the 1960s, a large number of activists and even whole units took positions opposing the official line in criticizing the merely reformist, legalist, and economist activity into which the leaders were dragging the party. The ideological discussion was mainly centered around the opportunist theory of the peaceful road to socialism, transformed into the official line by the CP leadership. However, the struggle developed during this Congress was in no way capable of changing the opportunist positions. The bureaucracy of the pro-Soviet revisionist leaders was exercising a powerful control over the key organs of the CP. They were thus able to slavishly mobilize themselves to silence all those disagreeing with them by resorting to threats and pressures, corruption and other maneuvers, and to prevent them from being delegates to the regional and local congresses. Later, in 1963, the publication of the material of the Communist Party of China and the Party of Labor of Albania against modern revisionism was of invaluable assistance to the Marxist-Leninists who had begun to regroup within the parties manipulated by the pro-Soviet revisionists. This polemic assisted them in reaffirming their opinions against the widespread distortions of Marxism and providing new arguments for the ideological struggle with the important support of parties already in power, and finally, in showing that these deviations were not only a national and local problem, but a worldwide countercurrent launched by the Soviet leaders. Thus, with the polemic, a group named Espartaco, Spartacus, constituted itself within the Chilean CP in 1963, 
and began to publish and disseminate the Chinese and Albanian publications in Chile, in open opposition to and rebellion against the opportunist leaders of the party. The struggle against these leaders and their anti-Marxist line within the CP showed the people waging it that such leaders were not honestly mistaken leaders, but fully conscious traitors to Marxism-Leninism and unconditional agents of the USSR chieftains. They never accepted a frank discussion within the ranks of the old CP with those in disagreement with them, and not even with those who agreed with them but had doubts. In their fight against the Marxist-Leninists, they were content with slandering them, attempting to corrupt them, threatening and assaulting them, and with forbidding them to give their views. All this served to show that within the old CP, the minimal conditions of internal democracy necessary to have the Marxist-Leninist line adopted did not exist, because the bureaucrats sold out to the Soviet chieftains had received the order to impose their anti-Marxist fabrications at whatever cost. Therefore, the only alternative was to pull the honest activists away from the CP and to create a genuine Marxist-Leninist party. At the end of 1963, the internal struggle led to a split from the CP into the birth of a Marxist-Leninist group that kept the name Spartacus, forerunner of the Revolutionary Communist Party of Chile. When it started engaging in activities as an independent group, Spartacus also had to wage a fight against the Trotskyites who were trying to take advantage of the struggle against revisionism to infiltrate the newly born organization so as to take control of it. It also had to fight the Cuban leaders and their followers who were attempting, in a hypocritical and veiled manner, to serve revisionism by putting up the mask of ultra-left positions apparently different from those of the Soviet leaders. They rendered to the latter and their Latin American lackeys an invaluable service, in that a number of petty bourgeois elements, dissatisfied with the reformism of the pro-Soviet parties, were led to adopt various forms of armed struggle without any links to the masses, and doomed to be defeated and wiped out. At the same time, they actively preached that for the seizure of power, it was not necessary to build genuine proletarian parties and united fronts led by the proletariat. In this manner, they caused a large number of people who could have played a positive role within the Marxist-Leninist parties to be drawn away from the masses of the people, thus clearing the way for the poisonous influence of revisionism and leading these people to unavoidable death at the hands of the reactionary armed forces under Yankee imperialist advice. Thus, the guerrilla foci, and their later variations, urban guerrillas, expropriations, terrorism, etc., smashed throughout Latin America, were used by the revisionists in order to discredit armed struggle in general and to strengthen their arguments for a peaceful and reformist line. Finally, as Fidel Castro and the other Cuban leaders increasingly revealed themselves to be lackeys of Soviet social imperialism, they forced the groups close to them to openly put themselves in the service of the Latin American revisionist parties. In fact, these groups, by maintaining secondary differences with the revisionists and putting forward positions in appearance more radical, served to rally those who were dissatisfied with revisionism, to prevent them from opposing it on a correct basis within the masses, and to maintain them, in fact, linked with opportunist politics on the same question. The politics of the mere leadership in Chile, particularly during the popular unity government, are a good example of this. The Spartacus group not only worked directly among the masses and led numerous struggles, but it also carried out propaganda work and ideological education. From its birth, it published a daily journal called Combate, and a theoretical review called Principios Marxista-Leninistas, as well as a large number of factory newspapers, pamphlets, etc. In the second issue of the mentioned review, May to June 1964, I was asked by the leadership of Spartacus to write a detailed article entitled The Peaceful Road of Corbalan, Counter-Revolutionary Road. Already in this article, six years before the experience of the popular unity government, the farce of the peaceful road to socialism was refuted, and the tragedy to which it would lead the Chilean people if implemented was foreseen. The Spartacus group, in the context of the international struggle against modern revisionism, also started to establish links with the Marxist-Leninist organizations which had just been born in Latin America and other parts of the world, and especially with the Communist Party of China and the Party of Labor of Albania, which had always upheld the banner of Marxism-Leninism. 
these contacts had a prodigious importance for the transformation of Spartacus from a political group into a Marxist-Leninist Communist Party. The long interview that the greatest revolutionary leader and Marxist theoretician of our times, Comrade Mao Zedong, had with the leaders of Spartacus at the end of 1964 was particularly decisive for the building of this Marxist-Leninist Communist Party. During the interview, Comrade Mao gave us great encouragement for the arduous struggle that we had undertaken. He showed us that although in the beginning we were few in numbers, we would undoubtedly be successful if we remained loyal to principles and linked ourselves with the masses. He warned us that we would have to suffer setbacks, and he taught us to draw lessons from them, taking examples from the history of his own party and the revolution in his own country. He urged us to closely unite with the masses, particularly the workers and the peasants, and to lead them as well as to learn from them. Finally, he particularly exhorted us to study the concrete conditions of our country in the light of Marxism-Leninism, so as to better fight revisionism without falling into dogmatism and without mechanically copying from foreign experiences. 3. The Birth of a Genuine Communist Party The Spartacus Group, with the clear goal of establishing a genuine Marxist-Leninist Communist Party of Chile, set itself three basic tasks in order to achieve this goal. Firstly, the development of a long-term program for the Chilean Revolution that would lead the masses of the people on the revolutionary road, and at the same time, politically and ideologically unite those joining the party. Secondly, spreading the Spartacus organization over the entire national territory, in the Leninist organizational form, basic units, local and regional committees. Thirdly, having in its ranks a large majority of activists from working class and peasant origin. These basic conditions were met in 1964-65. to They were achieved in the active and fighting participation of Spartacus in the struggles of the workers, peasants, students, and other people against the fraudulent pro-Yankee reformist politics of the Frey government. In February 1966, the founding Congress of the Revolutionary Communist Party of Chile, Partido Comunista Revolucionario, PCR, Partido Comunista Revolucionario, PCR, was held in Santiago, in absolute secrecy. Ninety-three delegates from the various regional committees created in the country, and amongst whom the workers and peasants predominated, attended the Congress. The Communist Rebel Union, a Marxist-Leninist organization from the northern part of the country, created for the same ideological and political reasons as Spartacus, also sent delegates to the Congress. There were also fraternal delegations from the Marxist-Leninist parties and organizations of Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, Ecuador, and Peru, who, on the basis of their experience, made important contributions to the Congress and the birth of the party. The PCR, since its inception, had as a basic prerequisite for joining its ranks the acceptance of its ideology and main political line. It systematically refused to engage in uncontrolled recruitment, neither in the form of mergers with groups based on fundamentally different principles or line, nor through unprincipled proselytism. Just like Spartacus, it decided to maintain a basically underground structure. It firmly opposed organizing the party and carrying out its activities in the manner of the bourgeois parties, that is, on the basis of public meetings, public quarters, rallies of activists, commercial type of propaganda, large number of officials, open militancy, etc. One can use the bourgeois laws and institutions in the service of an essentially revolutionary policy, but without submitting and adapting to them, because that would compromise the political independence of the party and the security of its illegal work. The fact that the struggles of the PCR and its integration with the masses have not been known in their full breadth and depth is due, among other things, to these characteristics, let alone the deliberate will of the right-wing and traditional left-wing forces to block any information about the party. The PCR does not want to engage in glamorous actions of a publicity type, and that is why, as well as for security reasons aimed at making the struggle more efficient, it does not claim as its own all the struggles that it leads, and it even less tries to appropriate the struggles of others. However, larger and larger strata within the masses, and that is the most important, know its activities and positions, developed by living with the masses, sharing their struggles, their wheels and woes, and building the party in their midst. 
Thus, the development of the PCR and its influence are solid, profound, and stable, and the party is not subject to the fluctuations suffered by the bourgeois parties that base their influence on demagogical propaganda aimed at manipulating the people from the outside without really uniting with them and serving their real interests. While intensifying its activities among the masses, the PCR has developed to serve this task a broad work of propaganda and political education of the masses. In addition to numerous theoretical and political pamphlets, it has published various periodicals disseminated throughout the nation, such as Espartaco, Denuncia Popular, Popular Accusation, and El Pueblo, The People, which is still published underground today. From May 1968 to the 1973 coup d'etat, 25 issues of a theoretical review, Causa Marxista Leninista, have been published. This review even spread its influence outside of Chile, since a number of its articles have been reprinted in other countries. The Leninist underground structure of the PCR and its loyalty to principles on both the organizational and the political levels made it possible for it to be today in Chile under the ferocious fascist dictatorship far ahead of all the others, in better conditions to organize the resistance against the dictatorship. Almost all of its activities and leaders are inside the country. All its basic organizations and its auxiliary commissions have maintained their operations by making the changes necessary to adapt to the new conditions of repression. The number of its activists that the organs of repression have been able to identify is extremely small. On the other hand, these activists were prepared to fight in such conditions and they displayed the highest sense of revolutionary morality before the repression. It is for these reasons that the PCR, far from being destroyed, has considerably developed since the coup d'etat, from the point of view of both its militancy and its links with the masses. While the parties exclusively adapted to the legal style of activity, public quarters, officials, commercial-type propaganda, etc., have completely disintegrated, the PCR, with its method of direct work among the masses, of underground activity and simple propaganda within the reach of the workers, and with its experience of illegal work, is developing like a fish in the water. Another factor that has contributed to the upsurge of the PCR in the present conditions, the most difficult one can imagine for a work of opposition to and struggle against the ruling classes, is the fact that the broad masses are beginning to recognize that it has always followed a basically correct line, denouncing the farce of the peaceful electoral road to socialism and warning the people against the reactionary armed forces and against the fascist coup d'etat. On the other hand, the masses of the people who want to organize themselves and fight against the fascist dictatorship have increasing faith in the PCR because they know the efficiency of its organization and of its underground methods of work. All this has made it possible for the party to play an important role in the organization of the resistance, in the underground propaganda against the fascist military junta, in the assistance to the victims of the persecution and their families in the organization of the first struggles against the dictatorship, and in the ideological struggle against the opportunist leaders who led the people into the dramatic situation in which they are now.